I'm Katie Conroy, the Education and Engagement Specialist at Maine Maritime Museum. And I'm really excited to introduce Ben Martins, the Executive Director of Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, an industry-based nonprofit that identifies and fosters way to restore fisheries in the Gulf of Maine while sustaining Maine's fishing communities for future generations. Ben will be giving an in-person lecture at Maine Maritime Museum on Thursday, June 8th at 6 p.m. The lecture, titled The Future of Maine's Fisheries, Giving Fishermen a Voice, will emphasize the work Maine Coast Fishermen's Association is doing to amplify the perspective of those who live and work on the water in these unprecedented times of change in the Gulf of Maine. Head over to mainemaritimemuseum.org to register. For most people, like our relationship with the ocean is at the beach, right? Um, and our relationship with seafood is at, on the dinner plate. And um, for fishermen, that relationship with the ocean and with the seafood is is very, very different. And there's a lot of passion that's attached to that. And change is scary. And there's there's a lot of change coming for, for our fishing communities. Yeah, so I'm the executive director of the organization and I have been here for 11 years. So the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association was started by community-based fishermen who felt like they needed to have more of a voice in the policy arena. And so these were small boats uh, that were tied to a place. And most of them were actually from the community of Port Clyde. I don't know if you're familiar with our, our coast, but Port Clyde's kind of in the Rockland area, St. George. And essentially they saw that our natural resources were changing and that a lot of the regulations that were being put forward were not addressing the problem of we need more fish in the ocean. Uh, and a lot of the regulations were also pushing towards bigger businesses that were not based in Maine. And so essentially they're like, we need to grow a voice and we need to figure out how to bring that voice to the policy arena at the local, regional, and national level. Uh, they tried to do it on their own for a while. And then they kind of came together and like, we can't do this without some help and support. And so they hired me. Uh, and my background was I'd, I'd been doing uh, fisheries policy work down on Cape Cod for a couple of years. And um, so they, they brought me back up to Maine and uh, we started building an organization to work on ground fish issues. So ground fish are things like cod and haddock and flounder. Um, and as we started to work with fishermen in Port Clyde and then Harpswell and Portland and Kennebunk and uh, Booth Bay, we also realized that there was a lot of other fisheries uh, that needed help and support. And so we started working in scallops and when we had a shrimp fishery and men hated and herring and, um, you know, essentially what we try and do is we bring a, a voice of stewardship and community, small business and stewardship, um, or next generational ideas, right? So like, how do we leave things and build things so that we can have a next generation of fishermen in Maine? And that's kind of the through line of, of all the different projects and work that we do. And, you know, we started in policy, but pretty quickly you realize you can't just address policy if you're talking about a community of people. You need to start supporting them in lots of other ways as well. And so that's that's a lot of what our organization has been doing over over the past five years as we've been kind of growing and, and building on our, our successes and, and learning from the mistakes that we've we've made along the way as well. You know, we are fishermen driven, but we're a nonprofit. We have a board of directors that's a mixture of fishermen and community members because we can't do it alone. And, and part of our goal as a fishing organization is to bring our communities together to amplify voice. And if you just have a handful of fishermen that are, you know, fighting for good things into the future, but you don't have the community buy-in um, to support them and support their way of life and the community and the ecosystem. And at the end of the day, we're, they're feeding people, right? And so you want you want that side of the equation represented um, and, you know, recognize that fishermen are good at certain things. They're good at catching fish and they're good at running businesses and they're good at, um, you know, all the different pieces of that. But you know, when it comes to running an organization, building an organization that, you know, bringing the community together so that you can have those other skill sets that you need to be successful um, has really been a, a huge benefit. And so that was that was one of the things early on that those fishermen realized was that they can't do it alone. And um, and that's really the, the the thing that has propelled the organization into into the future is kind of building the support structure to 
to help those fishermen and empower them to do good where they where they do good and then you know have the help and support that they need in the other places there's a lot of great work that's going on in our fishing communities there's a lot of hard work that's going on there's a lot of conflict there's a lot of um stress and anxiety as there's changes coming with lobster uh and the whale rules that we're dealing with in the gulf of maine um offshore wind development uh and that's a new use in our oceans that um many fishermen are, are very concerned about what that means for the ecosystem but for our organization you know we we've been focused on a couple of of cool projects uh one is we've actually been outfitting all of our boats with cameras to collect data um, and turn fishermen data into verifiable data streams to be used in science and management. Um, Cause we have these, we have these data hungry systems in fisheries management and the data streams that are going into them are not always great and not always in real time. And we have boats that are out on the water all the time collecting data and information uh, and but when fishermen show up at a meeting and they say, this is what I'm seeing, the pushback is like, well, how do we know that that's actually what you're seeing? And it's not a fishtail, right? Um, and so we've been working with the Nature Conservancy and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute uh, to put cameras out on boats and um, implement an accountable fishery that's also collecting data for that fishery. And we've done that in both the, the groundfish fishery and the scallop fishery in, uh, in Maine, the Gulf of Maine, um, and actually throughout New England for, for the groundfish fishery. And then the other project that has been, it was a, a newer project. Well, there's two other projects that I'll, I'll just hit up quickly. The, the first one is um, one called Fishermen Feeding Mainers. Uh, it was a project that we started in COVID where a lot of the fish that we catch and land in Maine to get you know, sold into the, the restaurant marketplace and the restaurants all got shut down, right? And so we had fishermen that were landing fish at the dock that was being turned into lobster bait. And at the same time, we did not have enough food in our communities, food insecurity was spiking in Maine. We still have a problem with food insecurity, uh, despite the, the pandemic feeling over. And so we went out, we raised a bunch of money and we got money from um, COVID relief funds um, through the state of Maine and our congressional delegation to buy fish directly from fishermen at fair prices, uh, pay local work and waterfront businesses to cut and process that fish. And then we've been donating it into local food insecure communities uh, like Good Shepherd Food Bank, um, the Bath, uh, the Bath Area Food Bank, and also local sc schools throughout Maine. We have we've got schools all over the place that we donate seafood into, um, so that kids can get high quality protein. Uh, there's a lot of data that shows kids eating seafood is really good for their brains, and we don't do that. Uh, and so this program has been really um, amazing to connect the fishermen. Uh, the seafood and our communities again through through eating and and feeding and so that's been awesome we've we've actually just passed about six hundred thousand meals donated since um, October of twenty twenty so it's it's been a very impactful project for the working waterfront and and our communities that are um, often struggling to find good quality protein so um, that's one of our our highlight uh, one of our our you know the program out of crisis. That has just been a real, a real boon for um, all of our work and, and energies. And then the other thing that's a little bit harder to talk about, but you know, with the changes that are taking place within our, our communities and within the fisheries, there is a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety, um, and we have built a, a fisherman wellness program. And there's there's two pieces to that. One is mental health, right? And and this is a male dominated industry. There's a lot of times that. Um, Talking about mental health is a is a barrier, and accepting the need of mental health and support is a barrier. Uh, and so we've been trying to break down some of those um, conversations into digestible pieces for the communities, and kind of showing support um, in ways we've been able to provide access to counselors. We've been able to train counselors to be able to talk to fishermen and understand fishermen. Um, so that's an ongoing piece of work. And then on the wellness side, you know, we fishermen are. You know, I call them professional athletes. I think the technical term is industrial athletes, right? But like they need their bodies to make money. They work constantly with their hands, with their arms, with their legs. Um, and as you start to look at the older generations that are still out on the boats, they are bad knees. They've got bad shoulders. They've got, you know, arthritis. Um, and a lot of those things, if you start early, um, 
and you really lean into the the Tom Brady method, right? Like you can start to address some of those issues early if you plan for it, right? Um, and so we are really trying to empower our fishermen to understand it's like stretching is important. Training in the off season is important. Strength training, flexibility, like all these things. Um, that's that's how you build a healthy body and a healthy healthy support system. You know, you take care of your boat, you better take care of your body. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of bring that to our community in in a way that has not happened anywhere in the United States in in fisheries. And so we're we're really pushing pushing that um, right now in in our communities, which has been. Another like, you know, it, it's not always an easy conversation, but it's an important conversation to be had. So those are the things, you know, we are always working on fisheries policy. There's always things that we're working on on better science and management. Those things are boring. But, uh, you know, this is the stuff that's a little bit closer to home and, and closer to like the heart and brings the brings the energy to our um, to our staff and to the community when we're talking about like what how do we build better into the future? And, and this is. This is the way it's it's by embracing the people and recognizing that the the fishermen are a part of the food system and that we need to be supporting them as much as we're supporting good management good science and ecosystem climate change is such a a big issue to wrap your arms around right and when we when i was first hired when we first started working with fishermen in this space you know we typically had people show up and say, hey, we want fishermen to come and tell us about what they're seeing with climate change, right? Like we want these people to be the voice of like, oh, is the Gulf of Maine getting warmer? It's like, yes, it is. Um, you want a fisherman to tell us that? There's data that tells us that. Like we don't need to be putting these people. And so we, we are seeing change in the ecosystem. We are seeing warming waters. We are seeing different types of fish in our oceans. And um, you know, the fishermen are often left out of those conversations uh, when it comes to trying to think about solution building, when it try, when it comes to thinking about building resilient systems. And um, instead, they are asked to show up and talk about what they're seeing or experiencing, right? Um, and these fishermen, the men, the women out on the water, like are some of the just not only are they resilient, but they're, they're very creative in their problem solving. And so I we are really interested in the concept of how do we start giving fishermen voice in talking about climate change solution building, right? Uh, as opposed to just talking about, you know, the optics of what it means to have a fisherman out in front saying climate change is real. And um, so that's what we've been foc focusing as an organization recently is, um, you know, both dealing with the, the impacts of climate change um, and how do we you know, mitigate those impacts locally? Um, and how do we start to anticipate some of the changes that are going to be coming um, from those impacts? And, and so some of those things might be buying permits um, and holding them in Maine for fisheries that might be coming into the Gulf of Maine, like scallops or uh, squid, certain types of ground fish that we think are going to be winners as the ocean warms, right? Um, and and then thinking about how you build those, you know, seafood systems. Seafood is one of the best protein sources that you can choose to reduce your carbon footprint, right? If you're talking about eating, eating protein, uh, food system is one of the biggest contributors of greenhouse gases. And fish is a great choice if you want to be eaten clean. And you know, there's no water that's being used except for a very little bit in the processing, right? right? Like it's all, all in the ocean. Um, and despite, you know, when you picture the boat going out and catching these things, um, burning diesel, and it does, the amount of energy that goes into catching that pound of fish is minuscule compared to what goes into raising a cow or a pig. And so, um, you know, we really think that there's an opportunity to be talking about fishermen as solution building to addressing our own personal um, climate footprint. But it is, it's really hard to start thinking about climate change at a, a local level and at a business level for fishermen, because, you know, that is something that is still, we're seeing it, but it's also the future, right? And right now there's a lot of stuff on fire in our local communities. There's a lot of stuff on fire um, in policy and regulations that is a bigger threat. And so one of the, the balancing acts that we as an organization have to walk is how do you, how do you keep your eye on the ball out there 
while also addressing and building the bridge that we need right now to get to that that future. And, and so that it can be a very difficult conversation when you're sitting down talking to a fisherman about climate change and what that might mean for, for them and their family and their community in 20 years when they're looking at crisis right now that could put them out of business next year, right? And so um, this is, you know, I don't think it's a controversial thing to say, but like thinking about climate change in and putting it as a priority is often a, a thing of privilege. Um, it's something that um, those that have resources and time and capacity can really embrace and think about and do, and we need that happening. Um, the best time for us as an organization or a fishing community to think about sustainability and um, climate change. And like, we need to add stability into those fishing businesses so that they can start thinking about the long-term investments, the long-term changes that we all need to be you know, doing to address climate change and, and, and build that future. It's really hard to convince people to to have those conversations if they don't know that they're going to be there for that future. Um, and, and that's, um, that's a struggle that, that we go through with a lot of our, our you know, rural communities in Maine, when we're talking about um, farmers or fishers um, is, are, are we going to have these, these industries here? Are we going to invest in that? Um, or are they going to be lost and, and asking those folks to be the ones that are driving some of the climate conversation? Um, can be put those those individuals in in positions of of um, you know conflict internally when you're trying to figure out like what does it look like today and and how do you invest in that future? Climate change is a challenge, right? We are seeing high variances in water temperature and when the fish are coming in or the lobsters are showing up or the tuna are coming right. Like there's there's a lot more disruption that takes place because of climate change in any given year. And the stability around a fishing business um, is not the same as it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago because of climate change. So climate change is, is definitely a disruptor. Um, some of the other challenges, so we've got um, the right whale is a critically endangered species and uh, the northern right whale is a critically endangered species. There is a southern right whale. but um, And there's been several rulings by um, courts that have said that we must reduce risk to these animals by 90% in a very short period of time. And over a longer period of time, we need to reduce risk by 98%. And risk in the modeling and the work that they're doing equals rope in the water. So we have a lot of rope in the water when it comes to our lobster fleet. Uh, our gillnet fleet is also another, it's, a, it's called a fixed gear. So that means it goes into the ocean, it stays there for a period of time. And because we don't have a lot of data on where the right whales are, when they are there, um, we kind of are going to have to take some major, major um, reductions in the number of pieces of rope that are in the ocean in the Gulf of Maine, regardless of whether that rope is a threat or not in reality to a whale. And, and that means that we're going to have to dramatically reduce the number of traps in the ocean for lobstermen. We're going to have to put closed areas in place for other fisheries. Um, so there's going to be a significant disruption along our coast when it comes to how lobster and ground fish and everything else that kind of uses these fixed gear fisheries, how, how they're, how they're prosecuted, how they, how that business works. Um, so that's, that's the most immediate threat that, that our communities throughout the coast of Maine are facing is, is, you know, we have close to 4,000 lobstermen, um, with between 600 to 800 traps each and we need to significantly reduce the number of end lines in the ocean um and there isn't a clear path forward for how to do that while also keeping all those businesses um you know viable and so that's i think that's that's a scary thing for all of us in the industry uh and then the other one is um you know this is this is a little bit more of a controversial one throughout our state but Offshore wind development is a, a major threat for our commercial fishing industry um, and our ecosystem, right? And so we we are looking to um, build a renewable energy stream into New England, and a lot of those markets are in Boston. And in order to meet the goals that have been set out, 
um, it's been determined that offshore wind is one of the most viable sources to do that. And that means that we're going to have to develop our oceans, right? So like these wind turbines are 700 foot tall uh, structures that go out in the ocean. They float, uh, they are anchored to the bottom. But, um, you know, despite us using the oceans for centuries to harvest fish and seafood and shipping, um, this is this is going to be the most significant change that our oceans go through, right? We are going to be developing our oceans and um, there will be changes to the ecosystem. There will be changes to where the fish go. There will be changes to where fishermen can fish, right? So there's going to be a lot of conflict that comes with that. And, um, you know, we, we as a fishing industry have been told that um, offshore wind and fishing can coexist. And that is, that is our hope that with, that it can, but there's a lot of stress and anxiety around that because we don't know this is untested, right? This is, this is, I think we've got less than 20 wind turbines offshore in the entirety of the United States right now. And so it's, it is just, it is an un, untested reality and it's going to be such a seismic change in how we use our oceans that, um, that we are going full steam ahead on as, as a state, as a region, as a nation. And so that is, that is a thing that is of, of stress. And for our organization where we are, you know, we're an environmental organization, you know, a lot of our fishermen view this in the same way as you would not be okay with cutting down and, you know, you know, tracts of land to build these, these turbines, right? We as a community would say we are opposed to that if you were a land truster. And, and so, you know, the fishermen are like, we cannot support build, you know, even if climate change is, you know, Climate change is Thanos. It is coming. It is the big bad, right? But like the concern is, is that this is not the appropriate solution to addressing climate change. Um, and that because it is out over the horizon and that people don't have to look at it, it's a simpler solution, but not necessarily um, the right one. And so that's, you know, it, it's a difficult conversation to be had because we all use energy and we all everything we're doing to address climate change right now is actually just like, we need more energy, right? Like it's just, we're, we're transitioning from one energy type to another. And, um, and that means that we need solar and wind and nuclear or whatever those things are. And, and every one of those alternative energy sources has, has warts. Um, and, and we as a, we as a nation have not really, um, uh, you know, identified those those threats and opportunities appropriately for you know those who who make a living out on the water and who feed people and so for a lot of fishermen they they feel like offshore wind is going to be putting our our oceans at risk for the ecosystem changes that are going to be attached to those things and then you know there's also the idea of like well we're going to be transitioning food production into energy production and is that um is that the greatest use of our oceans? And, and maybe it is for the nation at large. I, I know where our fishermen stand and where I stand on that, but you know, that's one of those things that, that for every individual, it's, it's, it's a harder, you know, that's a hard conversation to be had. And, it, and it's, and it's an important one to be thinking about because it's, it is easy to kind of like put those, put those thoughts over the horizon, right? Like for most people, like our relationship with the ocean is at the beach, right? Um, and our relationship with seafood is at, on the dinner plate. And um, for fishermen, that relationship with the ocean and with the seafood is is very, very different. And there's a lot of passion that's attached to that. And, um, you know, change is scary. And there's there's a lot of change coming for, for our fishing communities. If you really want to get into the weeds of it, it is talking to people, building community, right? Like despite fishermen being, um, you know, the, the state bird, right? I mean, like, it's, it's just like, it's one of those things that, you know, it, they're, they're very iconic to our state, right? Like you could probably have a, a, a pair of waders on our flag at this point, and that would be appropriate, but like, there is still a significant disconnect between the fishing community and the rest of our community. And, and, and one of the things that's always really interesting is we've got some, we've been involved in some working waterfront issues recently. And so we've been sitting down and meeting with town planners and um, communities that are going through um, comprehensive planning processes, right? And 
anytime you say, hey, well, what about the fishermen? Everybody at the table is like, oh yeah, we got to think about that. But they would not have thought about it unless it was brought up, right? And so it's how do we start to create collisions within our community again that are beneficial conversations, right? Because like right now, a lot of times the fishermen and community members and whether they're new community members or old community members that are not attached to the fishing industry, the only time they they like have a conversation is through conflict, right? It's like, oh, why is there, that, that that's a really noisy boat. Like maybe that needs to get like, can we put a time limit on when you can like start your engine in the morning? Like that's a conversation that has happened in communities, right? Um, or, you know, I just, I just bought this beautiful house. Why, why do I have to smell fish all the time? This isn't great. Um, and so like those types of things are now like you're starting a relationship and a conversation in a place of conflict. And um, I, I'm just such a huge, huge believer that it's, it's hard to have conflict when you get to know people. And the best thing that we can be doing right now to support our fishermen um, and, and our communities is by building connections. We've become so siloed in our lives. Um, and, you know, whether it's politics or community, right? I mean, like, it's, it's just, it's really easy to get put into, into the bin of this is who I am. This is how I define myself. And these are the people that I see regularly. And um, this is my perspective and I'm good with it. Right. And it's, and it's, it's, it's hard to get that. It's hard to have those conversations that reveal um, other perspectives in a way that is um, respectful. And so I, I just always encourage people to, try and have and build relationships and conversations um, with the fishermen and the fishing communities. Like the fishermen that we work with in Maine are just some of the like hardest working individuals and insightful and brilliant and caring. Like it is, I, I was with, with one of our fishermen up in Port Clyde yesterday and like just listening to him talk about his family and his hopes and what he's thinking about for his business, but then for the ecosystem, like it was just inspirational, right? Like I'm going to, I'm going to be able to work on that, like little high for the next month because you just like walk away and you're like, yes, like this is, this is why we do the work. Like it's these kind of ideas. It's this concept. It's these. And so I, I am very privileged in that I get to have those conversations regularly with those fishermen and I, I can force uh, collisions of ideas and bring perspectives, but I, I just, yeah. I'm, I'm going too long winded on this answer, except to say, go make friends, like build connections within your communities and reach out to the fishermen. They are going through a lot right now. And I know that the support that has come from the broad main community around like the red listing of lobsters by um, Seafood Watch and like this, the whale, like it has, it has been amazing for the fishing community to see that swell of support from the broader community around this. And we need more of that. We need more building of relationship and support uh, in both directions. So. Oh, that is a fun question. What do I like best about Earth's oceans? So um, I don't know all of the oceans. So I, I, I will be extremely biased in saying that um, I, I am in love with Maine's coast and I'm in love with Maine's ocean. And it is, it is the, the smoothness of the top that is revealing underneath of like, I always reflect back when I talk to fishermen about our oceans, right? Because they will be looking at a chart. And for me, I am not a fisherman, right? I am, I'm a policy person. I grew up in the woods. Like I, I couldn't, couldn't tell, you know, one part of the ocean from a next from the next when I'm out on the boat, but it it's amazing when you're talking to a fisherman. They're like, "Oh, well, this spot right here, we're we're going by this spot on their boat. They've got a plotter out, right? And they can see these little humps and these little things that you know. And they're like, "Oh yeah, no, so and so, uh, he he hung up his net on this, and he almost tipped over, and his crew guy had like you know he had been drinking, and this happened, and then and so it's like you." these little humps and knolls in our ocean that you and I would never know about all have stories attached to them in the same way that if you take a farmer out into his woods or, um, you know, me out into my backyard, right? Like it's just, 
there is a sense of place to the ocean in the Gulf of Maine that is really, really special. And it's almost, it's a private conversation because nobody else knows about it, right? And if you look at a chart and they've all got these weird little names on this little crevice or this little hump or this little knoll, and it's like so-and-so named, you know, Jeffrey's Ledge. Like, who the hell was Jeffrey? But like, you know, like we just, every one of these places has a story. And when you sit down with fishermen and, you know, they're like, oh, well, this is three Dory and that means this and th this over here. Oh, well, this are, we used to catch so many dabs in this area right here. Like this was called the dab toe. And this was, it, there's a sense of place to the Gulf of Maine. And because it has been fished for such a long time and because it's been such an important part of Maine and, you know, Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, Canada for, for so long, it just, it's got a, it's like you have your own private story of the history of that ocean every time you talk to the people who use it. And so I, I just kind of love the, it feels exclusive in a way, right? Like the story of our sea and, um, and the people who are so private about that story. Um, and it is sad because some of that gets lost over time, right? And and it's hard to present, protect and preserve that. But I, that's what I love about our our ocean is like there's a there's a there's a, a layer that you can look at that is beautiful, and there's a layer that you can look that at that is delicious when it comes to seafood, and then there's another layer of all the history and culture um, that is at the bottom, and it's the deepest layer, and it's the hardest to get to, but it is it's really special and something that most people never get to experience is the stories of our sea. And I, uh, I love it. So.